Okay, so this is part five of the War of the Flea. I'm going to put some resources in the Jumbotron as well as in the comments. Just give me a few seconds to set some things up and then I'll get right into the book. It won't take me long. Basically, I want to make sure that the previous spaces are in there as well as some mutual aids that I'm going to post in the comments section. Well, if I can find it. So let me pull up the previous spaces of War of the Flea. I encourage y'all to go back and listen to that. And also, here's a free PDF so people can read on their own time and feel free to share as much as possible. The whole purpose of this space is to make information, especially radical information, more available and accessible to people. I know finding leisure time to read books is a privilege in and of itself. So being able to cut on an audio where someone's reading and breaking down what we're reading can be helpful to others. So I put the the previous parts of the reading in the Jumbotron in a thread, and then I put the also the free PDF. Today we're starting from chapter six. And before we start though, let me put these mutual aids that I bookmark in the comments so people can support as well as a movement that's going on in Kenya currently. Again, y'all can check that out in the comments. Give me a few seconds to finish that. Other than that, I hope y'all are doing okay. There's a lot of shit going on, so. Put this one. And also, if y'all have any mutual aids that y'all want to share and bring attention to and awareness, feel free to leave them in the replies as well. I have one more I want to make sure is on there. Mm, this one. And I see a request. Give me one second to pull this, to pull this one up. And then I'll, I'll give you a mic. Okay. Hey, what's good? <laughs> yeah, I can really I didn't well. know that you could like, speak on spaces on your laptop but you can do that now if anyone wanted that info yeah i think for a long time you couldn't do that it's only from your phone so yeah that's helpful thank you yeah no problem so i just have one more mutual aid to put in the comment section and again if anyone has any more feel free to leave them so I think I put about four mutual aids in the replies. Again, the PDF of War of the Flea that we're reading is also available in the Jumbotron and also to the previous spaces that we read. And let me give EMS a mic real quick. Hey, what's up? You requested a mic. Um, me not off mute, so my bad. You can take me down. Oh, it's all good. I'll put you back on the snare. Okay, so I'm going to go into chapter six, and it's the political character of the second Indochina War, the American role, and the expansion of the war. So just a brief description of what we're reading about. This is a study guide to guerrilla warfare, and he's using the Vietnam War as an example, and also to the author, Robert Tabert, is going to go through different conflicts and how guerrilla warfare worked and how the empires responded to them. So, and if any time y'all have like questions or a thought that y'all want to share, feel free to request a mic. Now I'm reading a PDF, so I'm not looking at the space, so I won't be able to see it. So if you leave me a DM and those who have my number, you text me, I'll be able to see it. So I'm going to dive right into it. The silence that follows the fall of 
Dien Bien Phu is but a moment in the span of history, an all too brief breathing spell. Scarcely five years separate, the first Indochina War, as Bernard Fall called it, the second. From the second, the collapse of the Geneva Accords resulting from Washington's intervention in Saigon and the repudiation of the Geneva Agreement for a national plebiscite to determine the political future of the two Vietnams was followed by the formation of the National Liberation Front and a new guerrilla campaign. Again, Vietnam became the focal point of global concern, the storm center of a vast political conflict, a clash of ideologies and empires threatening major war in Asia or worse. Yet from a certain point of view, little seemed to have changed. To the peasant looking up from his rice paddies, the warplanes whining overhead on their way to distant targets in the north, the helicopters clattering towards some battle rendezvous, ran, oh, I'm sorry, rendezvous <laughs> were indistinguishable from the planes and helicopters that had carried French troops into the battle a decade earlier. To the guerrilla in the brush, today's battle was like that of yesterday and last year and the year before that. The year was all of a piece and young men could not remember in their lifetimes when there had been no war. American uniforms had replaced French uniforms in Saigon. Directives came from Washington instead of Paris. The Viet Minh were now the Viet Cong and the new invaders, at first called advisors, then openly combatants, spoke English instead of French. It made little difference, except for the greater size of the invasion force and the superiority and profusion of its equipment, the wider, deadlier air war, the increased ferocity of the military machine, and the apparently exhaustible wealth of the enemy across the sea. The war continued, both sides pursuing the same objectives as before. On the one side, relentless determination to dominate at any cost, and on the other, defiance, a small primitive nation resisting massive oppression by the only means possible, paying a pious price in death, destruction, torture, but winning, winning the war of the flea. The outlines of disaster for the United States was apparent as early as 1963, where Senator George McGovern warned, the current dilemma in Vietnam is a clear demonstration of the limitations of military power. There, in the jungles of Asia, our mighty nuclear arsenal, our $50 billion arms budget, our costly new special forces, have proved powerless to cope with the band of ragged guerrillas fighting with homemade weapons. This is scarcely a policy of victory. It is not even a policy of stalemate. It is a policy of moral debacle and political defeat. That's the end of the quote from, the, uh, from Senator George McGovern. The warnings of 1963 echoed down the corridors of a seemingly endless hot hell in which the American posture is frozen and no protest can make the slightest difference, no appeal heard. 1965, the United States is now deep into the fourth year of an increasingly bloody battle for this land of mountains, jungles, rice paddies, and communist guerrillas. Since May 1961, when the United States first committed itself to support the anti-communist Saigon government, it has poured in vast quantities of men and machines, from rifles to rockets, from jeeps to tanks, from helicopters to jet bombers. The United States has moved in billions of dollars worth of most sophisticated weapons in its arsenal. It has given freely of its brains, its blood, and its lives. All has been to no avail. The world's mightiest nation has been unable to find the key to success in Southeast Asia. From the day it set foot in this unhappy land, the United States course in the fight against the communists has been downhill. That is a quote from the United Press International on March 25th. This is gonna be another quote. 1968, sometimes I think we are fascinated by this baited trap. We stand ready today poised, if you will, to plunge still deeper into Asia where huge populations wait to engulf us and legions of young Americans are beckoned to their graves. That is the issue. That was a quote on the Senate floor of September 24th, 1963.
if we are going to fight Asians in Asia with American men on an ever widening Asian front, then we had better face it now. We shall soon run out of men and money. That is from another senator, Frank Church, of a Senate debate happened on March 7th. And here's another. The fact is that victory is not just ahead of us. It was not in 1961 or in 1962 when I was one of those who predicted there was a light at the end of the tunnel. There was not in 1963 or 64 or 65 or 66 or 67. And there is not now. It seems to me that if we have learned anything over the period of the past seven years, it is the fact that just continuing to send more troops or increasing the bombing is not the answer in Vietnam. Moreover, there is a question of moral responsibility. Are we like the God of the Old Testament that we can decide in Washington, D.C., what cities, what helmets, and what towns in Vietnam are going to be destroyed? That's Senator Robert, Robert Kennedy on March 7th. So basically, the part where we're at is America is getting his ass handed to him by some farmers and just everyday people involved in guerrilla warfare who are fighting for their freedom and trying to fight off imperialists. And that America, in a broad display, because in the previous chapters, it described how this was one of the most public, the most defeats made public. It was on every TV and every newspaper. You were seeing the atrocities carried out by American soldiers. You were seeing the war crimes that they were committing. But then you were also seeing how the people of Vietnam were still fighting and winning and gaining ground and how many, how much money that not only money that they were losing, talking about the American empire, but that also the lives that they were losing in comparison. And again, they make us uh, an emphasis on highlighting that, oh, we have superior artillery and superior machines in the most technologically advanced military. And yet these farmers are kicking our whole asses. <laughs> again, the war of the flea. One speaks of the momentum of events and the momentum of a war or a political process as though discussing a heavily laden train speeding downhill with no one at the throttle. The analogy comes perilously close to fact when a Lyndon Johnson directs the course of affairs. But what is meant by political momentum is in reality, of course, simply the confluence of many interests, the coincidence of individual and group investments in a given course of action, and the reluctance of the participants to pull out, to let go. To a very great extent, this explains the Vietnam fiasco. Although a good deal of conservative as well as liberal opinion opposed the war, even stronger interests supported it. Organized labor, the longshoremen, the truckers, the mechanics, the machinists, technicians, and army of trade union members had an obvious stake in even a losing war. How was it to be considered negatively, or yeah, how was it to be considered negatively while the shipyards boomed, the aircraft and munition factories worked overtime, and U.S. bombers dropped more explosives on a single objective in Vietnam than had been expended in the entire Korean War? The Wall Street Journal might cavil, but a considerable sector of business was doing better than ever with Vietnam, the nation's single greatest industry. Taxes might rise, but so would government subsidies, so would government borrowing and interest payments. For the professional military, a phase from an old army song provided sufficient explanation. There will be no promotion this side of the ocean, and when would such a wealth of electronic gadgetry and opportunity to use it come again? For the Johnson administration, there was the patent inability to confess that more than 26,000 young Americans have been sacrificed by error. Here, Sorensen's six-sided box theory comes into play, providing as valid an analysis as any. Crowds might demonstrate, students burn draft cards, the clergy cry at, at I don't know this word, let me spell it for y'all so y'all can tell me in my inbox, A-N-A-T-H-E-M-A. -E if y'all can help me with that, I really appreciate it. The entire intellectual community condemned the war of aggression and the whole world point the finger of shame. Nothing is seen but total rout or the immediate threat of a nuclear war through Soviet or Chinese intervention, and this was considered unlikely, could persuade Washington to end a war already lost. 
How did the situation develop and why? In order to consider the conflict of Vietnam with any degree of clarity, it is necessary for Americans to digest some unpalatable facts. Unpalatable because Americans as a nation like to think of themselves as Democrats, libertarians, lovers of peace, despite the credibility gap, the lies so often given to Lyndon Johnson in connection with Vietnam, most believed him when he said, the United States seeks no wider war. We threaten no regime and covet no territory. The history or the historical record destroys such illusions. It shows that U.S. imperialism, the steady drive towards expansion and dominion, is as old as the republic itself. Antedated even the Monroe Doctrine, that first assertion of United States hegemony in the Western Hemisphere, it can be traced from the Seminole Wars through the Mexican War to the annexation of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines in the Spanish-American War. Nicaragua, Santo Domingo, Haiti, China, these are some of the names in a history of expansionist adventures extending, as the Marine Hem boasts, from the halls of Mozambique to the shores of Tripoli. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli. Japan was once to the Yankee Clippers at Cannon Point. American troops battled in China to suppress the Boxer Rebellion and distract an indemnity of ooh, $333 million for foreign concessions destroyed. American dollars and the United States Navy maintained the fortress of Taiwan, Matsu, and Kumoi against China to this day. The Pacific, um, the Pacific has long been an American lake. Ask the Bikini Islanders. We threaten no regime and covet no territory. Indeed. And that's the author asking, like, are you serious? <laughs> the spirit of isolationism, the psychological detachment from the affairs of Europe associated in the past with the United States policy, always more of a political mystique than a practical reality, never extended to Latin America or to Asia, and even the pretense of or disinterestedness ended with the Second World War. The war, imposing new responsibilities, also opened the doors to opportunity in every direction. The old spheres of influence and the old balances of power were disrupted. Colonial empires disintegrated. The first Indochina War was part of that disintegration. New boundaries were drawn up. What did not come into the American orbit would fall. So Washington feared into the orbit of China or the Soviet Union. French control of Southeast Asia had been tolerable, but an independent Vietnam, almost certain to go communist, and on China's doorstep, providing a great rice bowl for the world's most populous country and America's potentially most dangerous rival, it was an idea scarcely to be entertained. Almost inevitably, the United States moved to fill the vacuum left by the French withdrawal. Washington's reasons and fears were explained by many voices. These are going to be a series of quotes, but basically for anyone listening, what the author is basically explaining is that here America will talk about, oh, we're going into Vietnam, not because we want territory or not because we want to expand power and hegemony. And when history shows, that's exactly what America does. And it has done so since its inception. So that's basically what he's harping on. The war, oh, the quotes, the stakes in Southeast Asia are huge, asserted the New York Times of May 24th, May 1694, I'm sorry, 1664. If Laos and South Vietnam should fall to the communists, they would likely take with them Cambodia, Thailand, and Burma, possibly even Malaysia and the Philippines, close to 115 million people. The loss of South Vietnam, said former President Eisenhower, would mean a tremendous loss of prestige, the loss of the whole subcontinent of Southeast Asia. Joseph Auslop wrote, if defeat in South Vietnam is passively accepted, all admit that this defeat would be the worst and most costly that the U.S. has submitted to in its century. And from Life, that's a magazine, June 12, 1964. Abandoning Southeast Asia would be a disaster. The communist forces would take over. The U.S. would have demonstrated that it lacks the skill to win a guerrilla war and the guts to back its promises to its allies. U.S. military lines would retreat to Okinawa, Japan, and the Philippines would be endangered. 
Indonesia would be out of control, and U.S. influence in Asia, as a practical matter, would come to an end. These views were endorsed in official Washington, as Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara said in a policy statement, the survival of an independent, read U.S.-oriented government in South Vietnam is so important to the security of Southeast Asia and to free to the free world that I can conceive of no alternative other than to take all measures within our capability to prevent a communist victory. So basically, in order for America to keep its interest and its power in that part of the world, it had to win Vietnam, is what most of the quotes are basically talking about. But of course, they like to... <laughs> They like to use other words of distraction to basically basically say like, oh, we're doing this for freedom and democracy. And it's up to us as the oppressed as we read through these books and these texts to determine like, no, this is for expansionism. This is imperialism. This is white hegemony. President John F. Kennedy termed Southeast Asia vital to the United States as a specific power. And in June 1964, Lyndon Johnson announced that he would risk war meaning war with China, in defense of the area. Sound familiar? I'm just trying to tell you. <laughs> the United States' commitment continued to widen and deepen. By May of 1965, some 45,000 Americans were serving in the Vietnam theater, and direct military and economic aid to Saigon had risen to $700 million annually. By the end of 1967, more than half a million men were in action, the annual rate of expenditure was close to $30 billion, and the total cost to the nation in dollars had already exceeded 50,000 millions. <laughs> this is in a campaign of suppression against a foe so little resembling a conventional army that, as the Associated Press reported, and that 50,000 millions is written in word form, like, just so y'all know. Often, and this is a quote from the Associated Press of the time. Often, a Viet Cong unit is organized initially with no weapons. The political organizer tells his men and women they must fight at first with handmade arms, spears, daggers, swords, and crude shotguns. To get better weapons, the unit must capture them from the enemy. One can understand if not sympathize with the American expectation of succeeding where the French have failed. No, the fuck, I don't need to sympathize with that. But again, a cracker wrote this book, so just so y'all know. The new guerrilla uprisings involved only a third of the territory the French had sought to control. They did not begin to capture the Viet Minh in numbers, equipment, experience, or even initially in popular support. Washington could rely on a well-equipped native army of 350,000 men and itself had vastly greater military, military and economic resources than the French had ever dreamed of. Nevertheless, the course of the insurgency followed the classic pattern established in China and tested so well in the first Indochina War. Isolated acts of terrorism and sporadic attacks on remote military or police posts began as early as 1955, could not have been controlled except by calling out the army in full force. Yet the Diem regime could not make such a response without confessing that all was not well with the country and did not find it politically expedient to make the admission. Instead, Diem played ostrich, pretending that the bandits were under control and hoping that the national police would soon justify the pretense. Bandits is in quotes, because basically they're describing direct action that was happening starting in 1955. And how the government basically rendered itself powerless because if they respond, then they show that these guerrilla fighters have an actual impact. And they didn't want to, they wanted to save face instead. So they just pretended that these are just people not to worry about. And that was in 1955. <laughs> By the time magnitude of the Viet Cong threatened or threat was realized, the guerrillas had already gained formidable strength and were fully competent to cope with the Vietnamese army, even backed by Americans, arms, aircraft, and advisors. Progressive increases and the amount of, of United States military and economic aid to the Saigon government at all times lagged far behind the need of the actual situation. <laughs> so because the Vietnamese government waited, because again, <laughs> they, didn't want, they wanted to save face and not show that the rebellion was happening and it was on the terms of the people. And so they were going through direct action in a revolutionary process. Again, started on their terms. 
the, instead the Vietnamese government decided to ignore them and to save face. And then by the time that they decided to declare them like, oh shit, they're really about to win or, or they're making a considerable headway. By that time it was too late and they were already having to play, play catch up. And so again, this is why he uses Viet, uh, the Viet Cong and the Viet Minh in this example of guerrilla warfare and how not only did it, you know, the challenges that it, it faced their own government, the Vietnamese government, but also not only the French, which we read about earlier, but now the Americans are in play and they're getting their asses handed to them. Mm, 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 mm. This is inspiring. I don't know about y'all, but I get inspired when I read texts like this. By mid 1964, attacks and platoon strength had given way to organized assaults in battalion or even in regimental strength. And the Viet Cong had grown from a few scattered guerrilla bands to an army of more than 140,000, counting both Chulak regulars and auxiliaries. Neil Sheehan of the United Press International reported on April 27, 1964, from a few scattered bands backed by a fairly extensive secret political organization, the communist Viet Cong have built a formidable fighting force of 40,000 men. They are organized into 45 battalions throughout the country. They are supported by well over 100,000 less well-armed but still effective local and regional guerrillas. Strong rear, rear base areas have been established and the Saigon government have been virtually isolated from the rural population, comprising 85% of a nation of nearly 16 million people spread over a land area of some 127,000 square miles. Oof. I know that's right. Outside of the big centers of population, the guerrillas were virtually unchallenged in much of the country, unmolested except by aircraft and occasionally by big helicopters borne expeditionary forces, stabbing in the dark, seeking needles in a haystack. Government armored columns were able to enter Viet Cong areas, but not without danger of ambush and not with any hope of remaining or exercising authority over the people. Most of the major arteries of, I'm sorry, the arteries of almost all of the secondary roads have been cut. Some provincial capitals were accessible only by air and a ring of insurgent bases around Saigon created an atmosphere of siege, even in the capital. And with battles sometimes mounted within six or eight miles of the city, the Viet Cong maintain a viable rural economy in its own areas and Viet Cong tax collectors gathered important revenues from the commerce still continuing between the insurgent zones and the cities, to such an extent that in some cases, even the gasoline used to transport government troops to battle had already been taxed by the communists while on its way to the barracks. <laughs> That's dope. Basically, in order, for, in order for the army and the military to get from point A to point B, they had to go through the Viet Cong. And the Viet Cong was like, you want to pass here? You got to pay tax. And then, of course, they would ambush them as well. Yo, the power of the people. And it's, I'm telling you, revolution is so possible in our lifetime. I'm going to keep going. American economic aid to Saigon, exclusive of military aid, was put at some $241 million annually. Its object to improve the agriculture economy and win the support of the rural population. But the director of operations of the Agency for International Development, James Kalin, estimated that 10 to 15% of the total went to twi twilight areas that might be government controlled one day and in the hands of the Viet Cong the next. <laughs> That's dope. Basically what happened was the aid that they were giving to, to these uh, pockets that were working on behalf of the Americans, the Viet Cong would take that area over and take over all of that was sent. The money, weapons, everything. And it'd be used for the people's war. On August 15th, 1964, the New York Times reported, control over an area can change overnight. In many parts of the country, American field workers complete a technical aid project, a bridge road, or well, only to have the guerrillas occupy the village the moment the Americans and their Vietnamese co-workers pull out. What had happened in South Vietnam recalled the experiences of China and in other hemispheres of Cuba. 
the insurgents had established a competing economic and political system, dividing the national territory. And although the army might still go where it chose, but always in strong force, it could not remain without spreading itself too thin to resist concentrated guerrilla attacks. Thus, the troops were increasingly restricted to their garrisons in the larger towns and cities and increasingly made impotent. Clear and hold operations patterned on the French oil slick technique failed to remedy the situation for the obvious reasons. The clear and hold strategy is always doomed to failure because the government, while strong enough to clear any given area temporarily, cannot hold many such areas without dangerously scattering its forces. In the face of a determined clear and hold drive, the guerrillas simply withdraw and redouble their efforts elsewhere. Considering that the South Vietnamese army, if evenly dispersed over the national territory, would have about three armed men to each square mile, it is easy to see why clear and hold could not succeed against the Viet Cong, 140,000 strong and supported by virtually the entire rural population. Here, Saigon and its American military advisors encountered the French dilemma so well grasped by Giuk. If they scattered their forces, they became too weak to defend themselves, and their manpower was destroyed piecemeal. Yet, if they concentrated their strength, they surrendered their ter territory, which it was their purpose to occupy, for victory could not mean nothing if not the occupation of the national territory. More than 3,000 government troops today slogged through flooded rice paddies in a suspected communist stronghold 35 miles northwest of Saigon in one of the biggest, most fruitless operations of the Vietnamese War. The one read the troops I, uh, located wounded, a Vietnamese soldier with a shotgun and escaped. The news item reflected a typical situation. As in most insurgencies, the guerrillas were able to choose their targets and to accept or reject combat at will. The government, lacking the military intelligence that popular support provides, find itself groping in the dark, engaged in random hit or miss operations that were inordinately expensive for the results achieved. A few dispatch of April 21st, 1964, provides more evidence of the same weakness. One group of today's government statistics indicated the frustrations of this war. Government small unit operations such as searches or probes by patrols reached a peak of 5,190 during the week. The spokesman said that no more than 70 of these actually had made contact. The Saigon government had put itself under a severe handicap by refusing to admit for some years that significant armed opposition existed in the country. Isolated clashes with guerrillas were dismissed as police actions against a negligible remnant of Vietnamese diehards, and it was not until five years it's not until five years had passed that the regime of DM, uh, DMM, Washington's handpicked premier, was finally forced to concede the undeniable fact that a full-blown insurgency was in progress. The Viet Cong, meanwhile, had been building a powerful underground political apparatus and organizing guerrilla units on village and regional levels for the struggle to come. The early strategy of the movement was aimed at breaking the chain of political command from Saigon to the rural areas, isolating the government from the population of some 17,000 helmets and 8,000 villages by subverting, kidnapping, and assassinating local officials. In particular, village chiefs, and members of village councils. The campaign was begun in 1957, when more than 700 officials were killed and was sharply stepped up in 1959, continuing through 1963 despite government efforts to halt it and accounting altogether for an estimated 13,000 lives. With political liaison between the capital and the villages effectively broken, the Viet Cong began to build a real army. Although Washington sought retroactive justification for the subsequent escalation of the war and massive bombing of North Vietnam, Vietnam by charging aggression from the North, the truth is that until the bombing raids began in the later half of 1964, some 90% of Viet Cong arms were weapons captured from Saigon or American forces. Saigon's own statistics acknowledged that the Viet Cong captured 4,853 weapons during 1960, 
while losing only 921 weapons in action for a net gain of 3,932, sufficient to arm a regiment. In 1962, the insurgents captured 52,000 weapons and lost 4,850. And in 1963, the gain was 83,000, the loss only 5,400. The totals representing a net gain for the Viet Cong over a two-year period of 128,682 weapons of all types, a number almost equal to the total of insurgents in all of South Vietnam. Oh, yo, this sh- I be loving reading this shit. This shit got me so hyped. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> As indicated above, most of the Viet Cong's arms were seized in small unit engagements. Government casualties, too, mounted as the result of many, many such small scattered attacks launched wherever superior position and superior numbers gave the Viet Cong assurance of easy victories. Insurgents, operations, and battalion force were rare until late in 1963, and it was not until well into 1964 that the Viet Cong began to engage in isolated set-piece battles of a conventional sort, on occasion abandoning guerrilla tactics for local tests of strength. The, challenge, the change of tactics, while not yet a consistent pattern, was an important indicator, serving notice that the war was slipping into a new phase. From the period of the strategic defensive, so-called, to the stage in which an equilibrium of forces is reached and the government loses the military initiative to the insurgents. The scale of the fighting through 1964 indicated that the communists were rapidly gaining and the military were rapidly gaining the military initiative. When the United States military buildup began in South Vietnam in November 1961, reported United Press International, the situation had been considered critical because the Viet Cong had become strong enough to initiate no fewer than 1,782 attacks and small-scale incidents in that month. But in November 1963, after two years of massive American military and economic aid, the number of Viet Cong attacks and incidences jumped to 3,182 for the month. The continuing buildup was reported in December to have doubled the size of the South Vietnamese Air Force, but the results were by no means in ratio to the increase in striking power. As reported in the New York Times of December 3rd, government air raids against insurgent concentrations have forced communist commanders to make adjustments in battle tactics, but have not noticeably lowered their morale or fighting capability. According to a new intelligence analysis of weapons effectiveness in the guerrilla war, attempts to thin out the trees in jungle refuge have scarcely affected communist military operations so far. The analysis found even inexperienced guerrillas have learned to protect themselves from aerial cannon and rocket bombardment. The Viet Cong are known to have taken elaborate precaution against attack. Their main base areas consist largely of underground tunnels and caves strong enough in some cases to withstand direct hits from 500-pound bombs. Guerrilla veterans have learned to spot various types of aircraft and estimate whether their mission is bombardment or defoliation, uh, recognizance, or transport. The intelligence analysis shows that some Viet Cong units have specially trained persons who count falling bombs or incoming artillery shells and correlate them with the explosions heard. This way, they try to detect duds, which they can collect for their own use, for landmines, bombs, and grenades, etc. Oof, genius. The ratio of government casualties to Viet Cong casualties sharply alters with the passage of time, the former increasing and the latter decreasing, even by the government's own estimates. Official figures, as reported by the New York Times of October 18, 1964, shows 1961, government casualties, 9,000, Viet Cong, 13,000, 1962, government casualties, 13,000, Viet Cong, 33,000, 1963, government casualties, 19,000, Viet Cong, 28,000, in 1964, the first six months, Government, 11,390, Viet Cong, 9,000. It is well to bear in mind 
that the casualties of the Viet Cong reported by Saigon, one, are estimates made by the other side, and two, almost inevitably include civilian victims of our aerial, sorry, of aerial bombing and artillery, artillery, there we go, attacks, conveniently assumed to be Viet Cong rather than positively identified as such. One test is to compare the number of weapons captured by the government with the number of Viet Cong casualties reported, as against government casualties reported and weapons lost. In the latter instance, there is a general respondence, in the former, a surprising disparity. The arms captured from the Viet Cong rarely, if ever, match the reported Viet Cong casualty list, a fact that raises the strong suspicion that the dead in question were not armed in the first place. Again, the high proportion of reported enemy casualties arising from air operations raises a question about the accuracy of the casualty reports, who, in fact, counts the bodies, much less identifies them as those of combatants. In this connection, Bernard Falls writes in the two, in the two Vietnams, how the tactical aircraft now in Vietnam are used can be discerned from the official reports of the South Vietnamese Air Force. In a not untypical three-day operation in January 1963, the VNAF hit the following targets, one house, 20 watchtowers, and 10, it says 20 watchtowers, 10 and 22 miles west of P Pikachu. I'm so sorry. I know that's not the word. <laughs> Three houses, 28 miles west of Kui Nohan, and four houses and a rice field, 22 miles west of Piku, 25 houses destroyed and 10 damaged 17 miles southwest of Quang Nungai. And I'm sorry for mispronouncing all of those places. 15 houses, 22 miles northwest of Piku, two houses, 19 miles north of Bien Hao. And in operations against Viet Cong, concentrations in the plain of Reeds and the jungle bastion of Zone D, north of Saigon, the ARVN, Army of the Republic of Vietnam, reported 76 enemy killed by ground fire, 400 killed by aerial gunnery, and only nine individual weapons and five crew served weapons, machine guns and mortars captured, and over 400 houses and huts destroyed. It takes little imagination to guess who the enemy casualty must be in such circumstances. The indiscriminate use of aircraft against presumed Viet Cong targets does much to explain the alienation of the rural population from the Saigon government. Country people whose only contact with the government comes in the form of napalm and rocket attacks can scarcely be expected to feel sympathetic to the government cause, whatever it may be. On the other hand, they have every reason to feel solidarity with the guerrillas, usually recruited from their own villages who share their peril and their hardships. To the world outside South Vietnam's helmets and villages, the insurgents are agents of international communism. In the grass and bamboo huts where they live, in the helmets they have liberated, the Viet Cong guerrillas talk like local people about simple things. It was hell when we were attacked every night in my helmet, our hamlet, said a peasant's son in his early 20s. If the government was good enough or strong enough, I thought it should have been able to protect us at night. So I thought maybe the Liberation Front people were right, he said. Now I know they are. I don't regret my decision to join them. Another young man said, I was scared and angry when they attacked our hamlet, but I had to go along with them. And now I'm glad I did. The questioner was a Vietnamese reporter. He had taken local buses to hamlet in secure or disputed areas in a delta and found himself in a hamlet about which there was no dispute. Night and day, it was governed by the communists, except for the leader. The guerrillas seemed to be in their late teens or early 20s. They would not give their names for fear of disclosure to the government. They all said they were native of the hamlet, all spoke Vietnamese with a local accent. Asked what they think about Ho Chi Minh, president of North Vietnam, the leader, said, he is a great revolutionary. We like him, but do not take orders from him. We are South Vietnamese and are fighting for the liberation of South Vietnam. That's the New York Times, November 23rd, 1964. The greater part 
of rural South Vietnam, the shadow government of the National Liberation Front became the only government operating its own schools and hospitals, its own census, farm bureaus, tax agencies, news agencies, ruling by default the only contact with Saigon being the occasional punitive expeditions of the armed forces, ferried in by helicopter or risking the heavily mined roads and armored motor columns. Between intervals of attack and despite incessant air raids, something approaching normal life continued. Crops were planted and harvested, and slowly through steady pressure on army outposts in the twilight areas, the Viet Cong extended its domain. An early syndicated column in the New New York Herald Tribune in April 1964, Walter Lippmann reported, the truth which is being obscured for the American people is that the Saigon government has the allegiance of probably no more than 30% of the people and controls, even in daylight, not much more than a quarter of the national territory. That's the end of the quote. In a determined effort to rectify the situation, two major decisions were made in Washington. The first resulted in the overthrow by a Saigon military clique of the DM regime and the murder of DM and his brothers, who had headed the National Police Force. The second produced the specious, or the specious, I'm not sure what that word is, sorry, Gulf of Tonkin incident, an allegedly unprovoked attack by North Vietnamese torpedo boats against U.S. naval vessels. Getting rid of DM solved nothing. Nine successive puppet governments, all equally inept, equally corrupt and oppressive, failed to improve public support or improve the fighting quality of a native army doubled by conscription to 700,000 men. Nomial elections, scarcely worthy of mention, mocked the democratic process. The Gulf of Tonkin attack was used as a means of obtaining a blank check from the United States Congress for escalating the war and launching a massive campaign of round-the-clock bombings, raids against North Vietnam. Now, where does that sound familiar? How October 7th, how they say Hamas attacked, you know, this festival and they they doctored these numbers. And then when when the truth was uncovered and made public, it turns out that the people who died on that beach and at that festival was actually shot by the IDF and the IOF soldiers, <laughs> their own people. But then they used that to say that's why we're bombing, even though October 7th isn't where this genocide starts. It's already 75 plus years in ongoing campaign of just eliminating institutions like hospitals, uh, colleges, universities, libraries, museums. I can keep going on. But I just want to draw the parallels to where, again, we're talking about guerrilla warfare, which is not just happening in Palestine, but it's happening all across the global south right now. And we need to understand like why these things happen, but also too, as the empire's propaganda tries to tell us that they're fighting a losing battle, that reality and history shows us that they actually have everything to gain. And oftentimes are pushing the empire against the wall when they fight back. And again, I think this is important for us, especially those who find ourselves in the belly of the beast in Western empire, a colonized people within a colony. That when we see that these strategies do win, and that there's people already standing up all over the global south in this fight, that we only have one call to action as the join. But I'll keep reading. Uh, let's see. As to the air war against the North, it is demonstrably created the very effects that it was supposed to be combating. The trickle of arms that had come from North Vietnam became a flowing river, so that by 1967, Virtually all first line combat troops of the Viet Cong were armed with the most modern Chinese and Soviet infantry weapons, including automatic rifles held superior to any produced by the United States. Heavy machine guns, mortars, mobile rifles, rockets, and rocket launchers poured into the country by the hundreds of tons. North Vietnamese troops, including artillery and anti aircraft units, began to arrive in force infiltrating across the demilitarized zone or via Laos and Cambodia to back the Viet Cong with some 80,000 men, the equivalent of four divisions. Guerrilla war escalated to the stage of a strategic offensive where Viet Cong units had waged a war to flee, fighting and skipping away the reinforced guerrilla army 
began to fight in mobile columns, striking boldly into the provincial, I'm sorry, into the provincial capitals, ambushing large American and Saigon forces, laying siege to strategic bases. While U.S. military commanders continued to insist that they were gaining control of rural areas long held by the Viet Cong, the National Liberation Front was planning a new strategy. And with the coming of the Lunar New Year of 1968, the Tet Offensive against the major cities of South Vietnam began, and Saigon, the capital itself, was suddenly incredibly in danger of being overrun. This is going to be a quote. For the second week in a row, the cities of South Vietnam shuddered under the devastating blows of war. Day after day, thick columns of smoke from burning homes cast a black pall over the urban landscape, and thousands of panic-driven refugees spilled into the streets, reeking with the bittersweet odor of rotting corpses. At night, the helpless huddled in the shelter of churches and in dusty pagodas, oh, pagodas courtyards, while airstrikes and artillery fire split the darkness with thunderous flashes. And with each dawn, there still seemed no end in sight. Thus, the blood-drenched battle for control of South Vietnam's major cities ground on. That's Newsweek, February 19th, 1968. And I think it's interesting to note, too, like as these this war continues, that the guerrilla army has made sure to make sure to create alternate systems so that the people can still survive and that this people can still live on and build life while the simultaneous war for the on behalf of the people wages on and keeps gaining ground so they had alternate economic systems probably bartering was part of it there is a book that i have that details like everything that they built and is really worth studying and of course not just vietnam but to study guerrilla warfare that happened across the global south but i'll continue Five weeks after the offensive began, Viet Cong units were still entrenched in the ancient capital of Hue, which they had briefly controlled. When the final U.S. Marine assault to oust them from the ancient uh, citadel was launched, it was discovered that no one was there. The adversary had slipped away in the night. The easy transition from one stage of guerrilla warfare to another, from scattered guerrilla fighting to major assaults by mobile columns, and then dispersal and resumed guerrilla harassment is a style that the conventional forces have found it impossible to counter. Attacks on the city forces, or attacks on the cities force the defenders to concentrate their forces. When they do, the guerrillas are free to widen their control of the countryside. When the defenders again launch, uh, I don't know that word, radicages in the countryside, the guerrilla forces concentrate to ambush isolated units to threaten strong points, or again, to feed at the cities. Such was the impression made by the Tet Offensive that in May, when the Viet Cong began a series of rocket attacks from the suburbs of Saigon, the rockets fired by small squads of infiltrators brought the response appropriate to another full-scale invasion of the capital. The artillery and the bombers pulverized entire districts of the city they were supposed to be defending, adding to the flood of refugees and wounded compounding the problems of the disrupted, demoralized city. To the north, another Dien Bien Phu threatened, as a North Vietnamese and Viet Cong force estimated at 20,000, lay siege to a strategic base at Kinsan, held by some 5,000 U.S. Marines and infantrymen. The base was described by the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff as an essential strategic position. Its importance may be judged by the intensity of the effort made to hold it. Here's a quote from the New York Times. Since January 22, says an Air Force spokesman, Air Force, Navy, and Army planes have hit the enemy with 80,000 tons, 160 million pounds of ordinary of ordnance at Kinsan. We plan to keep up the pace indefinitely. And 80,000 tons, the spokesman continues, adds up to more than non-nuclear tonnage dropped on Japan throughout World War II. Again, that was the New York Times, March 28, 1968. And a few weeks later, a relief column was sent to reinforce Keshna. And a month later, it became known that the base had been quietly evacu evacuated, along with the strategic valley that it had been intended to control. In Saigon, 
the newsman who had released the report was deprived of his accreditation as a correspondent. Oh, shit. So basically, <laughs> the guerrillas, they took over the base and they lost it. And when a correspondent reported that loss, they lost their accreditation because they wanted to keep their losses under wraps. Because again, as they gain more ground, it encourages more revolts and more people to join the guerrilla fight and fight for the people. Mm -mm -mm. I mean, we're seeing that now as people speak up against the atrocities and the genocides going on, not only in the Congo, but what's happening in Sudan, I'm sorry, the Congo, Sudan, and as well as Palestine, that when people speak up about these things and highlight them, that oftentimes you'll see people lose their jobs and their positions and things like that. I'll keep reading. A few weeks later, a relief column was sent to reinforce Keshna. And a month later, it became known that the base had been quietly, oh, sorry, y'all. South Vietnam was paying a heavy price in the struggle. There we go. And most of it undoubtedly fell on civilians. In Hue, for example, it was estimated that 4,000 civilians had been killed in the crossfire between American troops and the Viet Cong during five weeks of battle. Before the beginning of the Tet Offensive, the number of war refugees was put at about 800,000. The offensive and the U.S. response created an estimated 700,000 new refugees. In May, the bombing and shelling of the Saigon suburbs and the fires that followed destroyed more than 10,000 homes and added 102,000 to the refugee population. Each new chapter in the struggle freshly illustrated the nature of the U.S. dilemma created by guerrilla tactics. To oppose the guerrilla forces, the Americans were compelled to destroy the very country they were fighting for, yet not to fight was also to lose. Every battle meant the attrition of native support and the creation of new Viet Cong. Losing battles caused the defection of erstwhile allies through failure of confidence and fear of the collaborators' fate. Winning battles created new bitterness among a people seeing their relatives and neighbors tortured and slaughtered. The greater the violence, the wider and more severe the negative results. Yet, on the other hand, to wage less vigorous campaigns was to, to permit the Viet Cong to throw wider their net with the same results, increasing defections and widening alienation. So basically what he's describing is that what the contradiction that America is facing is the more vicious they become, the more bombs they drop, the more they make their tortures of Viet Cong people, or I'm sorry, Vietnamese people uh, public and more like atrocious and more demonic as far as their torture techniques, the more people went over to the guerrilla army, the more people became Viet Cong, the more people supported them and made sure to, to help them in whatever way possible and also engage in self-sabotage and direct action themselves because now they want these American torturers out. But then if America was to pull back on some of their violence, again, the guerrillas would still make headway because remember the guerrillas goal and complete aim and dedication is to liberation at all costs, no concession. But let's see what happens. The dilemma was uh, plainly or plaintively put by a U.S. airman interviewed by a Wall Street Journal correspondent in Pliku. The American helicopter pilot is deeply discouraged. His squadron had adopted a hamlet near here and was trying to develop it. We were building a school, doing a lot of other things. We were just about, oh, we just about had the place pacified, he recalled. But during the Tet attacks, we took heavy ground fire while flying over it one day. We didn't want to do it, but we had to shoot up that hamlet pretty bad. Now the major wants to start another pacification project, but somehow I just can't put my heart into it. That's the end of the quote. The varying fortunes of war were also having their effect at home, where the public response alternated between demands for a quick resolution of the war and outcries of distress over the human costs entailed. Exactly the, what you're hearing now with, you know, the genocide that is being funded by the American imperialist and how the people are now dissenting and doing direct action and having protests, massive protests, and calling for an end to genocide. So, again, draw parallels. Been here before. I'll keep reading. 
In mid-March of 1968, American casualties in dead and wounded reached 139,801, exceeding those of the Korean War and making Vietnam the fourth bloodiest war in United States history. According to that diligent scorekeeper, the New York, the New York Times, the war in the air touching few targets of any military importance in the North but claiming countless victims in the blackened hamlets of the South was also becoming costly to the United States. The total loss of fixed-wing aircraft in the two Vietnams was announced on July 28th as 2,226, a figure considered by the North Vietnamese to be a gross underestimate. Their claim was more than 3,000 shot down over North Vietnam, Vietnam alone. In addition, the Saigon, commanded, the Saigon Command admitted the loss of 1,889 helicopters. Time! Americans' prestige in the world at large was at an all-time low. <laughs> the U.S. economy, although superficially prosperous, was showing signs of strain. A budget deficit of $25.4 billion set, set a new record. Taxes were rising, yet welfare programs were being reduced because of the cost of the war. An American society was divided and demoralized to an extent not seen since the Civil War. Still further domestic problems threatened. In an age of social upheaval, swept by cross-currents generated by popular expectations that no technology, however bountiful, could meet, the United States was having sufficient difficulty controlling its own restless, riot-torn cities without seeking to impose its alien will on a defiant nation 10,000 miles away. American negotiators at preliminary truce talks in Paris spoke as though dealing from strength, demanding surrender as the price of peace. But the guerrilla formula of space, time, and will worked for the Viet Cong, who had an ample supply of all three to pit against the military and economic might of the United States. Given its crippling liabilities, limited time, inadequate manpower, and diminishing political resources. And that's the end of chapter six. Let me see how long I've been reading. Okay, that's been an hour. So I'll go ahead and stop it there. Uh, let's see, this is page 90. The next chapter is called Wars of National Liberation and Their Costs, The Irish Troubles and the Role of Black and, and Tans, Terrorism in Israel, and Rebellion in North Africa. So, yeah, I'm going to stop it there. And just to remind everybody that there are mutual aids in the responses and the replies and to, to amplify them and spread them as much as possible in support. And of course, the previous spaces are in the Jumbotron as well as the PDF. I'll open the room for any discussion anyone wants to have, but I also want to say there's no pressure. That it's okay to just sit down and process this thing or even go back and listen to it again or read it on the PDF to digest all the information we just read. But real quick, I want to kind of do like a brief recap of what we read. So again, he's given another example in which when guerrilla warfare is in full-on process, right, the revolutionary process is at hand, that the people, even with makeshift shotguns, shovels and rakes and weapons that they stole from the invading imperialist forces, they were able to do so much damage and that this damage wasn't even, couldn't even be kept secret, although they tried. But when they did try to keep it a secret, talking about the Vietnamese government, try to keep it a secret, it only worked in advantage to the guerrilla fighters, to those organizing. So while the government was trying to keep a hush hush on like, yeah, we have an ongoing rebellion, the resistors found that time to create an alternate economic system, a way in which to gain transport, winning over people in the rural country, in the rural areas and spreading their message, but then also training. And then again, once guerrilla warfare was, was in full swing, by then, not only the Vietnamese government, but then the American government as well, who wanted to stop communism from spreading and to gain and to keep their, their white hegemonic power. <laughs> once they got in the photo, it was too fucking late. And so I just want us to also too, if you go back and listen to the space, Kind of see where you are and where it parallels like presently, right? How right now, you know, we have people openly calling the president of the United States, rightfully so, genocide Joe. That, that is also a 
that's a sign that again, not only that the illusion of the American empire is crumbling, even though if it hadn't crumbled for people before, I don't know what y'all were looking at, but let's just meet people where they're at, right? <laughs> it's crumbling and people are dissenting, not only abroad, where people are calling out, you know, America's mass military industrial complex and their whole deal of imperialism and destroying and genociding people worlds over. That people are saying enough is enough, not just in the UK, not just in the the East, but across the global South, in the islands, as well as home in the belly of the beast. And how important it is that if we call ourselves people who want to see liberation in our lifetime, that it's not on us to just sit back and get a chair and watch the global South engaging in revolutionary warfare. We would have to make the beast sick sick from within. And we're in the perfect position to do so. But I'll leave it there. And again, I want to thank everyone for coming and listening. And I encourage feedback. So if there's any fa- feedback you want to give, f- feel free to go in my DMs and I'm, I'm open to it. I forgot to remind people that captions are available on this basis. I am going to do a better job of that. But if there's no one who wants a mic, it's all good. I'm going to go ahead and close out the space. And again, thanks everyone for coming. Ooh, real quick before I close it out, let me check the comments just in case anyone had a question. So, ooh, so Captain Pronouns put more mutual aids in the replies. I encourage people to check them out and support them. And yeah, a lot of good information in the replies. So with that, I want to thank again everyone for coming. And I'll close out the space and check out the replies for the mutual aids to boost. Look out for each other and take care of each other. And let's get free.